I'm Carrie Funk. I'm the Director of Science and Society Research at Pew Research Center. We're based in Washington, D.C. What we do at the center is bring information into the public sphere that helps you understand the issues and trends occurring in societies around the world. We really focus on the pieces of science that connect with broader civic issues. I started my career working on media polls in a pre-election context where you're trying to track policy issues, but also how people are going to vote in an upcoming election. The focus there is really on surveys and survey research that became my specialty. One of the big questions is how will the coronavirus pandemic influence people's trust in scientists and their work? There is something about this period of time, this coronavirus era, that has politicized their view of scientists. Burn the mask. Burn the mask. Burn. How did this happen? One thing that we know and that we've seen from Pew Research Center surveys is that early on, say around March, when the outbreak was really taking hold across the country, we saw what I like to call the kind of a, a brief moment of American unity. where we saw close to nine in 10 Americans say that all of those kinds of measures were necessary. But within about four to six weeks of that period, we started to see this political divide open up. Around eight in 10 Democrats say that the coronavirus outbreak is a major threat to public health. It's about half as many Republicans. One of the challenges right now actually stems from our information environment from our reliance on social media, from the ability to share information so much more quickly than we ever could before. It allows each of us to be a content provider. In just about 48 hours, you can spread misinformation all the way around the world through these channels. That means that if you're trying to counter misinformation, you also need to be working in real time. You cannot afford to wait. And that has to do with really cognitive psychology. If you let these ideas stay out there and if you allow them the opportunity to be repeated and repeated and repeated, all that does is make it harder and harder to combat false information. Some people think about divisions and have even used the idea that there's a war on science. The thing that we see in center surveys is actually that there's no particular segment of the American public that takes a position that you might consistently think of as anti-science. Sometimes we see things like climate issues that are strongly divided by politics. I can't underscore that enough. It's not a crisis. The climate's been changing forever and it will always change. But we don't see political divisions in other areas or we haven't up to this point. How people are thinking about these issues is really rooted in the beliefs they bring to the table. The beautiful child went to have the vaccine and came back and a week later got a tremendous fever, got very, very sick, now is autistic. We asked about what would lead to more trustworthy scientific information. Most people said that when they hear about scientific research where the data is openly available to the public, that tends to increase their sense of trust in that information. So that really underscores the idea that transparency can help foster a better sense of trust in scientific research. It's helpful to come back to the idea of trust being an expectation for the future, trust being built like a relationship. In this case, we're talking about a relationship between two groups of people, the public and the scientists. It would take repeat interactions deserving of trust. And so that's one takeaway for the scientific community. If you're wanting to build more trust, you need to think about it as a relationship that you try to nurture over time. <laughs>
I started scientific strategy with my friend. We started a Facebook group where we wanted to share new scientific discoveries with our friends, family, and people who are interested in science. That very small Facebook group gradually grew to become a volunteering team of hundreds of members all over the Arab world in a matter of years. Saudi Arabia is an oil-based country. Our whole economy to a very recent period was maybe 70 to 80 percent based on oil. However, the oil prices on several occasions dropped down to catastrophic levels where the Saudi economy could not sustain itself. Saudi Arabia now is trying to diversify its economy to a knowledge-based economy. This was propelled by the new Vision 2030, where science is taking the lead. The Saudi government themselves determined that Saudi Arabia should focus more on science as a national strategy. Prior to the recent interest in science, it was just something secondary. It was a near luxury. It was not a necessity. However, that now shifted 180 degrees. We are now seeing heavily reliant decision-making process on scientists and their research and policy recommendations. And even to the highest level of government where you have scientists directly advising all of the decision makers, whether it was the king, the crown prince, or the ministers themselves. And that is uh, quite a transition. There are a few mega projects in Saudi Arabia that include NEON. They are trying to build a whole new city from the ground into a smart city. You will have smart roads, sewage systems, smart factories, smart healthcare, smart telecommunication. Basically, the stated goal of the government here is to have more living robots in this city more than humans. I feel that people like interacting with me, sometimes even more than a regular human. The interest of the Saudi government in science definitely impacted how the public sees science. Now people are more aware of STEM fields, for example, and how they should determine their career for the future. Medical research, mathematics, physics, and even now the rise of Saudi space industry. They are going for astrophysics. So the public is shifting their interest in alignment with the government. So that's one of the points we can compare between Saudi Arabia and the United States, for example, where you have your political lines that is drawing the acceptance of science, the utilization of science as division factor or tool did not happen here. We don't have political multi-pluralism. What happened actually since day one in the coronavirus pandemic is that the Saudi government took the scientific recommendation and they implemented it right away. I will give you, for example, one of the main concerns here in the scientific community was the vaccination. People believe in vaccination. There was a law for the protection of children here in Saudi Arabia that mandated vaccination. And if you not vaccinate your child, you are an abuser and you are a criminal. There was no two parties trying to play on this issue in order to polarize their supporters over it. We have only one player in the field here, and thanks God, they were <laughs> scientifically oriented. However, even if there were some divisions, they can be simply overruled by a governmental rule. There was a law that stated anybody who's spreading rumor is going to be criminalized. There was no shopping panics. There were no empty shelves. Everybody stayed calm. The disinformation or misinformation that revolved around the COVID-19 pandemic here in Saudi Arabia or the Arab world are very similar to what you have seen in other parts of the world. However, to give a special Saudi perspective, the first epicenter of the pandemic here in Saudi was in the eastern region of Saudi Arabia where I am stationed. The people who are living in that area are from a religious minority. At the beginning, they were the most affected people and by default, they were the most transmitters. There was a type of xenophobia or racial or religious bias against a certain group of people. However, when the pandemic hit all parts of Saudi Arabia and everybody felt the impact, that narrative or that level of rhetoric came down and people started realizing the level of the catastrophe that we are going through. Since day one of the pandemic, we have seen a united front from the government. I believe this is one of the most important causes that Saudi Arabia was able to tame the virus since an early stage.
What brings me hope for the future are two things. First of all, the status of science today, the amount of strides that we have already made. The second is that people are going to realize that international collaboration is the only way forward, and we are going to see huge reforms for the UN, WHO, the WTO, and other international bodies, because this is the only way that we can move as a human race. One of the things that's really interesting is the conversation around emerging science and technology. And it's really important to understand how people are responding to these new technologies. I was very interested in the conversation around robotics and artificial intelligence. It is a very trending topic here in Saudi Arabia. You have that discussion more public in the U.S. because how AI is especially utilized in social media and maybe in decreasing jobs and such. However, here in Saudi Arabia, because it's a new industry, we see it as a job creator rather than a job competitor. When we look across these kinds of emerging developments, including autonomous vehicles, robotic caregivers, biomedical interventions that can change human abilities, what we see is really this concern about losing human control or human agency. And that's something that surely goes across borders. Human agency and the sacredness of a human life is a very important subject in Islam, which is the official religion here in Saudi Arabia. So how is that going to be evolving? How these kinds of new developments are used make all the difference. As long as they're keeping in line with existing moral norms, then it's okay. But when they start to really violate those challenge. principles or challenge them, yes, exactly. So that tends to lead to more problems. Exactly. And that actually can bring us back to the original discussion about misinformation or disinformation and their relation to science. We as scientists try to look at it from a purely scientific perspective. However, what I believe that we should do is to consider this more of identity issue, such as what your wonderful research has shown recently, that the divide in uh, trust and scientists is somehow drawn around the political affiliations. Trust in scientists is politically divided on ideological lines, not just in the U.S., but also in Australia and Canada and most of Western Europe. Correct. And there was another research that I have come across recently from Maryland University, where they also found that people are receptive or have tolerance for others based on their political identity, more even than on the, based on the issues they tend to disagree on. So regardless if you are pro-choice or pro-life, just identifying yourself as a Democrat or a conservative Republican, that will make me decide how I'm approaching you. So I would love to see more research from you uh, around this issue. The issues worth thinking about are global. So I would be delighted to collaborate on issues around emerging science and technologies, around how social and religious divides are part of the picture. Regarding collaboration, definitely I would go with trying to communicate the new researches to the public here in Saudi Arabia. I'm a, a professional geek, so I, I am very interested in, in any infographics Dr. Frank have to offer. Certainly, I would love a tour of Saudi Arabia, and to see it from your eyes would be fascinating. Definitely. Uh, let's uh, wait until the pandemic is over, and you are welcomed at any time. Sounds good.